place in prayer. May the Lord's help together in the meeting. Let us ask the Lord to come and to speak to each of our hearts as we gather together. Our gracious Father, how we thank Thee this afternoon as we approach Thee in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ that he is the one that was lifted up upon the cross. We thank thee that as he was lifted up, he was lifted up as that ransom for sinners. O oh Lord, we thank thee that from him flows that healing virtue, that all that look to the Lamb by faith, all those that look to the one that was lifted up and cursed for us, all those that look in saving faith, they will be saved. We thank thee then that we have this wonderful message to proclaim that the only begotten Son is the one that sinners must believe in, that they might not perish. Lord, we recognize that there is the awful curse of sin upon this land. How many lie with condemnation hanging over their heads, and yet with no concern for their own souls. O oh Lord, we pray that even this time that we will see the Lord come in mighty power. That we'll see the Lord touch the hearts of the unbelieving. Lord, we pray that we will see sinners delivered from the wrath of God, brought into that place of safety and security in our Lord Jesus Christ. Oh Lord, we pray to that end that even in our day that you might be pleased to show us your own reviving power we pray, Lord, that you'll come and move in this city, in this state. And we pray, Lord, that there will be a mighty turning again unto thyself. Revive thy work, we pray. Oh, Lord, we do pray for those that have gone forth to sometimes difficult places to proclaim the word of God. And we do pray, Lord, that you will bless the missionaries that we take particular interest in, those connected with our, our own denomination. And we do pray, Lord, that you will be pleased to undertake. We pray very especially uh, for those that uh, are still uh, suffering greatly at the hands of uh, COVID-19 lockdowns. And, oh Lord, we pray that you will minister to your saints, give opportunities in evangelism, and Lord, we do pray that in the midst of all of the fear that men and women will fear the name of the Lord. And, oh Lord, we pray that people will be brought to a fear of eternity and brought even to look to thee for mercy. Oh Lord, we do pray that you will be pleased in these dark days to advance your own cause as your word has given us so much cause to believe that it will be so, that there will be times of reviving and refreshing, and we pray then that there will even be, at this time, a mighty move of our Lord. Oh Lord, be pleased to come and undertake in this gathering this evening, minister to all of our waiting hearts, we pray in Christ's great name. We're going to further worship the Lord, please, with the words of the hymn 107. Alas, and did my Saviour lead, and did my Sovereign die, would he devote that sacred head for such a word as I. Another Isaac Watts hymn. And so we'll stand as we sing this together.
the Son of Man must be lifted up. Who is this Son of Man? Jesus, sorry, then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. We'll end there, knowing the Lord will add his blessing to the reading of his precious truth. We'll have now the Catechism. We'll come to the question 90. How is the word to be read and heard that it may be effectual, it may become effectual to salvation? That the word may become effectual to salvation, we must attend thereunto with diligence, preparation and prayer, receive it with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. And so salvation here is in the broad sense that the Christian can say that we have been saved. So we've been delivered from the penalty of sin. The Christian is being saved. We are being delivered from the power of sin. So the Christian is to be progressing. In that sense, we are being saved. But then we will be saved in the sense that we will be delivered from all, even the presence of sin. We will be delivered from the presence of sin. We will be presented perfect in heaven. So we have been saved, we are being saved, we will be saved. And the uh, words here, that the word may become effectual to salvation, we are to understand them in this broad way, that it does relate to the unconverted, but it is also dealing with the Christian, that we are to be progressing, in holiness and in this sense that uh, we are being saved then the, the word is to be effectual to us and so there is to be preparation for the reading and hearing of the word there's to be preparation for uh, our own quiet reading then of the word as well uh, as of coming to uh, the, the public place where God's word is read and preached so there's to be preparation but then there must be penetration, as there is this preparation. It speaks then of how the word is to be received with faith and with love. The word is to be received and on Friday at the children's meeting. The children were learning how in Berea, they, those in Berea uh, searched the word of God to find what they had been told was the case. And so these were more, more noble than they in Thessalonica. And as we read the Word of God, then there is to be this receiving, there's to be a scrutiny, and then the Word is to be preserved, lay it up in our hearts. It is to be preserved, and then it is to be performed, practice it in our lives. It's not enough just to hear the Word, but we are also to be doers of the word. May the Lord help us not just to be empty hearers, but those that obey the word of the Lord. May the Lord bless those few thoughts to our hearts. Thank you all for coming this evening. It's good to see each one gathered with us, and we trust that the Lord will minister to our hearts as we come soon around the scriptures. We're going to sing again, please, and we're going to sing the words of the hymn 100. The hymn 100 is certainly a favourite among us. So Christ, what burdens by thy head, our load was laid on thee. Thou stoodest in the sinner's stead, did spare all ill for me. The hymn carries the title, though it's not printed here, Substitution. And what a wonderful truth is set forth here, that Christ is the great substitute. The hymn 100 Remain in seated, please, as the offering for God's work is received.
We will turn please in God's Word to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I want us to look this evening with the Lord's help at the words of the verses 30 and 31. But we will read please from the verse 26. So John chapter 14 and the verse 26. But the Comforter which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I have said unto you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard how I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, ye would rejoice, because I said, I go on to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. And now I have told you before it come to pass, that when it is come to pass, ye might believe. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the Prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me, but the world may know that I love the Father, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. We trust the Lord will again bless the reading of his word. We'll seek the Lord's face together, please, in prayer. Our gracious Father, we thank Thee for the privilege we have this evening to meet together here and to open up the Word of God. We ask that the great help of the Lord will be given to us. Take Thy truth today, we pray, and write it upon our hearts. We pray that this will not be merely an intellectual exercise, but rather that our hearts will be touched, that even as we were thinking earlier, of how the word is to be led up in our lives and it is to be practiced. We pray that that will be so even as a result of this meeting. So grant us that needed help of the Holy Spirit of God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. In John chapter 14 and the verse 30, the Lord said to his disciples, The prince of this world cometh. The prince of this world cometh. Uh, and this is one out of three occasions in the Gospel of John where our Lord Jesus Christ referred to Satan under this title, the prince of this world. We read earlier in the meeting in John chapter 12 verse 31, Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out and the casting out that is in view here the casting out of Satan is in relation to the cross verse 32 and I if I be lifted up from the earth will draw all men unto me this he said signifying what death he should die and so then this judgment the casting out of the prince of this world it was in view at Calvary. There was a sense in which Satan was cast out by the cross. In chapter 16 and verse 11, again it refers to this judgment that we've just read about. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. And so we have this reference then. In the passage that we're looking at this evening, John 14 and verse 30, the prince of this world cometh. He comes, but as he comes, he will be cast out. As he comes, he will face great judgment. And Satan then is described here as the prince of this world. We are being shown that he does have strength. He does have authority. He's a prince. But he is not supreme. 
Rather, he is a usurper. And even this title, the prince of this world, is not Satan's by right. And so as God created this world, by right it was not Satan's. Remember how man was given that place of dominion in creation. But the devil came to deceive, to destroy. That the devil would have a place of dominion and he, he usurped that place then by overcoming man as were in his deception of man where man then came under his submission his subjection and Satan then is a fallen prince he is a rebellious prince he is the usurper and he is described elsewhere as the God with a small g of course the God of this world the God of this fallen world. Uh, and so as we come to these words, we uh, are not to think that Satan has no ability whatsoever. So Satan is a prince. He has a dominion. But praise God, he is not supreme. By the cross there was a casting out and of course there is a great future destruction for Satan, where Satan will finally uh, be crushed and uh, speak no more to the distress of the uh, elect of God. As the Lord spoke here of this prince then, the devil, the Lord said to his disciples, the prince is coming. I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. And the Lord then says, really, the opportunity for conversation is limited. There's limited time. The prince is coming. And so at the end of verse 31, the Lord said to his disciples, Arise, let us go hence. Now a lot has been said about these words at the end of verse 31, Arise, let us go hence. They are easy enough to understand as the words stand. But the question raised is this. Did the disciples at that point rise with the Lord and leave the upper room. Now before I suggest an answer to, to that question, in chapter 18, in chapter 18, we read a detail concerning the Lord's movements. Chapter 18, the verse 1, when Jesus had spoken these words, that's the words of his high priestly prayer in chapter 17, when Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with the disciples over the brook, the brook Kidron, where was a garden into the which he entered unto his disciples. And those words seem to suggest that the Lord had come at least near to Kidron, just as he was concluding uh, the words that he was praying in chapter 17. Now to come back to this question, at the end of chapter 14, when the Lord said, Arise, let us go hence. Did they get up and leave? One answer is that they did not. And so the suggestion by some commentators is that the Lord said, Arise, let us go. And they maybe stood up, but the Lord kept talking to them. And so he continued to speak to them in chapter 15 and chapter 16. We all do that. Some of you maybe do it more than others when you say, I'm going. But you're still there half an hour later. And so some suggest that's what in view here, that the Lord was showing that it was very soon when they needed to leave. And by saying, Arise, let us go, he was showing we only have a few moments. And so he continued to speak in these next two chapters. Another view is that the Lord and the disciples did actually leave at that point. And uh, those that suggest that uh, say that when in chapter 15, the verse 1, the Lord said, I am the true vine. That perhaps now he had moved through some of the streets in Jerusalem. And he was pointing to a vineyard. And he uh, took this up then, this illustration of himself as the vine. In chapter 17, as the Lord prayed, it says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven. And those words suggest that the Lord was outside 
uh, by that uh, particular stage. Now, no a vital doctrine hangs on either of those two views that uh, I've mentioned, but I just want to uh, explain what this is. Arise, let us go hence. Certainly the Lord was impressing upon the man. Soon I am to be arrested. Soon I am to be put to death. And as the Lord was speaking then, saying the Prince is come, the Lord was reminding his disciples again of his omniscience. He was all knowing. The Prince is coming and therefore there is only a little time in which we can talk like this. Tomorrow night will not be in a gathering like this. So little time. And surely the way the Lord was speaking here then is so different than the way you and I can speak to one another. So we don't know if we'll have another Lord's Day evening like this. Me addressing this congregation, you being in it. We don't know what a day will bring forth. But the Lord knew... And so he said, hereafter I will not talk much with you. He had just spoken to them of how he had been speaking to them about various things that were to happen. And he says, I've told you these details before it happens. But when they do happen, that ye will believe. And so again, as the Lord was saying, the prince is coming. In coming days, the disciples would look back and they would say, the Lord knew what lay before. The Lord's omniscience was evident. Since he was omniscient, he was therefore able to accurately prophesy what lay ahead. And these were moments of exhortation. And I believe they were also words that were very prophetic. And for these next hours, the prince of this world what the Lord said here was fulfilled. And so I want to consider with you this evening the rebellious prince is coming. Uh, think about the, the, the prophecy that's in view here. First of all, there's a prophecy of legal confusion. A prophecy of legal confusion. A worldly legal confusion. The Lord said here, in verse 30, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and notice these words, and hath nothing in me. And hath nothing in me. But what does this mean? That Satan is coming, but he doesn't have anything in me. And what has been emphasized is this, that Satan cannot make any effectual or accurate accusation against Jesus Christ. So Satan would do his best, of course, to raise accusation, but he cannot make any accurate or effectual accusation against Christ. He had nothing in him. Satan had nothing to hang his case on. Charles Ross said, he has no sin on which to fasten his arrows. A.W. Pink said, there was nothing combustible in Jesus which Satan's fiery darts could ignite. Those quotations are reminding us that Satan works by accusation. And so Satan then would seek to raise an accusation against Christ to bring about his crucifixion. Now in relation to Satan as the great accuser, against mere man, he can bring various accusations. Now for the child of God, those accusations will not stand. But the, the devil can bring accusation against the sinner. We have sinned. We have broken the holy law of God. But against Christ, there could be no accusation. He was the lamb without blemish, without spot. And so Satan then, as he was coming against Christ, remember this is what the Lord is saying, the prince of this world cometh. Satan had a problem. 
because he wanted Christ to be destroyed in death. And yet there was no accusation on which that death could justly be brought about. In relation to Satan's attack at the cross, Satan made use of instruments. And he still does. Ephesians 2 verse 2, it speaks there of Satan as the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so Satan takes the unconverted. He works in them. They are the children of disobedience. And now there are times as well, sadly, where Satan can even use the Christian to bring words that are untrue. Remember that time when Peter was trying to tell the Lord there was no way that he would be put to death. And the Lord said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. And on that sad occasion, Satan was a spokesperson for the devil. Sadly, there can be times that we can even be a spokesperson for the devil. But chiefly, it is the children of disobedience that are Satan's instruments. And certainly that was the case in our Lord's crucifixion. Judas was an instrument. Do you remember that night to see... As Judas left the upper room, we have those words that he went out and it was night. It was night. And surely that is saying more than Judas merely opened the door and it was dark outside. That, that was true. But as Judas opened the door and left that upper room, he went out in servitude. To the prince of darkness. And as at this very moment then. Judas was plotting with those religious leaders. Christ said to the disciples. The prince of this world come. He's working through the one. Who has lifted up his heel. Against us. The Jewish leaders were also instruments. Of Satan. As they tried to plot and scheme to bring about the Lord's destruction. Even to the extent where they said eventually that Caesar was their king. Words that they would never have dreamt I'm sure of saying before. But such was their hatred of Christ. They would even stoop to say Caesar is our king. Judas was an instrument of the Jewish leaders. The Roman soldiers. And Pilate were instruments of Satan. Satan would use them to bring Christ to the cross. You remember the Jewish leaders had decided the sentence for Christ. So too had the devil. The sentence was death. But the problem the Jewish leaders faced was this. That in order to have a sentence... There had to be a charge. But they did not have a charge. And so after Christ was arrested in the garden, he was brought, and in that religious trial, there was an effort to find a charge on which to condemn Christ. If you could turn with me, please, to Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, and the verse 55. Mark chapter 14. And verse 55, the chief priests and all the council, the Sanhedrin, sought for witnesses against Jesus to put, to, to put him to death and found none. Now bear in mind the words of our text, the prince of this world cometh, he hath nothing in me. The chief priests were looking for witnesses. Find none. Verse 56, And many bear false witness against him, but their witness agreed not together. And so under the Jewish law, there had to be two or three witnesses effectively saying the same thing. But one man would come and lay an accusation against Christ, 
And so they would bring the next witness and he completely contradicted the first. And so there's this great confusion. Why was that? Because Satan had nothing in Christ. There could not be this raising of an accurate accusation. And so then verse 57, there rose certain and bare false witness against him saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. But neither so did their witness agree together. And so there was still this difficulty. And what then the high priest decided to do was that he would ask Christ the question, Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? And Christ then would be condemned upon his answer. That he was the Christ. They had nothing in him. Nothing in him. No effective charge could be raised against him. You think of how Judas, before he destroyed his own life, he came back with the money. He cast it down and he said, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And surely, if there was one that ever could bring an accusation, it had to be Judas. He had been the one who followed the Lord. He had heard the Lord. He had witnessed so much. And yet he had to say, He's innocent. A betrayed innocent blood. He had found nothing in him. And we think of the civil trial that the Lord had to undergo then as he was brought to Pilate. Pilate said, I find no fault in him. And so the Lord, as he said here, the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. The Lord was really showing to his disciples there is going to be so much confusion over these next hours. With all of this determination to destroy me. But there will be great confusion. Now why is all of this important? Well the Lord was showing his disciples this. That the world. To show that the world is all the evidence. That as Christ went to the cross. He was not guilty of any personal sin. Really there was no charge against Christ. And the best they could come up with was that he was the king of the Jews, the Messiah. And so the world today still has all the evidence that Christ was innocent, holy, harmless, and undefiled. And the world then are left without excuse. Because here is the message that the sinner is not without sin. The sinner is not innocent. That Christ then died because of sin, but not his own. Sin that was imputed to him. And you think even of that placard, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. It was no charge. Why was he there? He was there to bear away the sin of others. This detail that we have is also important because the world has all the evidence that Christ's death was voluntary. Christ says here, hereafter I will not talk much with you for the prince of this world to come. And then he says, arise, let us go hence. And so he said, the prince is coming. We might have expected then that he would say, let us try and escape. But no, he says, let us effectively go to him. And remember, that's what happened in the garden. As the soldiers came to arrest the Lord, the Lord said to them, Who are you here to arrest? I am the one that you're seeking. They fell back with amazement. Christ's death was voluntary. He led down his life for the sinner. But this detail also shows us that the world has all the evidence that Christ was smitten by the Father. 
Our Lord said, The prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. And yet at the cross there was a smiting. He was stricken and smitten of God. And so while the prince of this world had nothing in him, as Christ was brought to Calvary and sin was laid upon him by the Father, he was made sin for us. He was stricken, smitten and afflicted by God. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. And all of that confusion and manipulation only corroborates the, the truth of God's word. That Christ is the very one that the sinner needs. But I want to see here, secondly, there's a prophecy of fierce conflict. Now Christ says in verse 30, But hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh. And the prince was coming then to engage in conflict. The prince was coming in a state of Eminente. No matter how the Lord had spoken about this hour is the hour of darkness. Luke twenty two fifty three. 53. When I was daily with you in the temple, ye stretched forth no hands against me. But this is your hour and the power of darkness. The Lord entered in them to this great hour of darkness. And that great prophecy of Genesis 3.15 was a coming to one of its grand fulfillments. Remember how in Genesis 3.15 there was that great preaching of the gospel, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, between thy seed and her seed, it or he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And Satan then was coming and he wanted to bruise the heel of Christ. And there would be great enmity. And there would be a bruising. But praise God, there was this great victory. Christ would bruise the head. Christ would bruise the head of Satan. I think of that detail of Satan seeking to crush Christ's heel. Don't we see evidence of that? As we witness the Lord from his arrest, the brutality, he was beaten. Remember the psalmist, and like the beating of his back to the plowing of a field. He was beaten. There was that mock coronation, the crown of thorns brought down upon his head. He was dressed and dressed in that robe, but then the robe was torn from his bleeding wounds, nailed to the cross. It was all the taunting and jeering at the cross. What was this? It was Satan seeking to crush the heel of Christ. But as Satan lifted up his heel, Christ lifted his. Christ bruised. He crushed the serpent's head. Now, where does the strength of the snake lie? It lies in its venom. It lies in its head. And Satan then is the great accuser. Does we think of Christ then as he crushed the head of Satan? Christ has dealt with this very matter of accusation. There was great conflict, but what a conquest on that resurrection morning as Christ came forth triumphant. The Satan didn't get to sing long. He didn't need much sheet music for that particular song that he was singing. And Christ then crushed Satan at his most 
strong and poisonous pleas. The cross silences the hiss of Satan. And I want you to look with me then, verse 30, in another light. Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh and hath nothing in me. And men and women, if you are in this meeting tonight and you are converted, those words relate to you as well as they related to Christ. Satan hath nothing in you. Yes, you have sinned, and you do still sin. But this verse is most beautifully setting forth the gospel. That as Christ was brought to the cross, he was sinless. Yet sin was imputed to him, and as sin was imputed to him, he bore it away. And remember, we have those great words in Hebrews chapter 10. Their iniquities, their sins and iniquities, will I remember no more. And all the record of our sin then, it has been taken, it's been removed. The record of it's gone, it's blotted out. So then, when the sinner comes and rests upon Christ in salvation, what a transaction takes place. And therefore, Satan no longer has any effective accusation against us. Remember, that's one of the great themes of Romans 8. Who shall lay any charge to God's elect? As Satan would like to. But he has nothing in us. The record of our sin is gone. And these words then are to give great assurance to the child of God. And now some would take these words and say, well, if Satan has nothing in me, then I can live the way I please. It's a twisting of God's word. Satan has nothing in us. Let us then live to the glory of God. As Christ had said, if a man will love me, he will keep my words. These words drive us to evangelical obedience, to Christian obedience. And tonight then, dear believer, how we can rejoice. Satan has nothing in us. And now he will come as the accuser. He will remind us of our sin. We are to remind him of Christ, even to remind him of these words, Satan, you have nothing in me. My sin is gone. Now, how different for those in the meeting who are not converted? And for if you're here tonight without the Lord, Satan has very much to hang you on. There is much by which you're to be condemned. And your only hope then is that you would come to Christ. To be delivered from that awful record and guilt of your sin. Here's a prophecy of fierce conflict. But I want to see finally this evening, there's a prophecy of widespread conversions. Uh, I mean uh, geographically many places. In verse 30 it says, Hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of this world cometh, and hath nothing in me, but that the world may know that I love the Father. But isn't it interesting that the Lord said, the prince of the world is coming, but the world will know that I love the Father. And so Satan is this governor over a fallen world. But from that fallen world, from that company of fallen mankind, there will be a people brought who will know that Christ loved the Father. And he was perfectly submissive to the will of the Father in going to the cross. So it wasn't Satan's accusation that got Christ upon the cross. It was Christ's obedience to the will of the Father. Christ's love of the Father that the world may know that I love the Father. And through the cross then the devil is stripped off his power. And we have 
Something similar taught in Luke chapter 11, though it's a different figure of speech that's used. In Luke 11, 21, when a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. And the idea there is that the devil is a strong man, the prince of this world. And the devil has this armed one, keeps his palace, his goods are in peace, in the sense that the souls are secure under his control. They will be lost. And the reason for that is Satan raises accusation. And the sinner is condemned on the basis of sin. But in Luke eleven twenty two, 22, But when a stronger than he shall come upon him, and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armour wherein he trusted, and divideth his spoils. And so Christ then has entered into the house of the strong man. And Christ is the one that is stronger than the strong man. And Christ then has taken this people. He has removed all record of their sin, and thereby he has taken from Satan his armour wherein he trusted, and divided his spoils. And so all through the Old Testament, generally speaking, the nations were kept in darkness. And Satan, as the prince of this world, kept a palace. And the goods were, generally speaking, not being taken from him. But in the cross, Christ has entered into that palace. Christ then is taking a people onto himself. Satan can no longer be the one that holds them. Christ has gone to relieve sinners and retrieve them from that awful tyranny of the devil. And therefore I believe verse 31 is speaking of very definite conversions. But that the world may know that I love the Father. Now if we speak to the unregenerate and say to them that Christ loves the Father. Generally speaking, that is not something that interests them at all. Who in Perth tonight is really interested in this detail that Christ loves the Father? It's those that are, that are converted. And so for the Lord to say, the world may know that I love the Father, and, uh, and as the Father gave me commandment, even so I do. This is a great promise of conversions. Now people who have no interest in Christ, that have no interest in the gospel, are suddenly taken by the work of the Spirit. The Lord deals with them. And when the Lord deals with them, they do know and they treasure this truth. That Christ loved the Father. He obeyed the very commandment of the Father. You remember Judas, not Judas Iscariot, the other Judas had been very keen that Christ would make a manifestation to the world. Verse 22, Judas saith unto him, not Iscariot, Lord, how is it that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? And what Judas, and of course the other disciples too, what Judas wanted was a political type kingdom. He wanted a physical throne to be set up. And he wanted even the Romans to be brought under the submission of this great throne of their Messiah. It was something like that that Judas had in mind. The Lord then says, there's a prince coming. He's nothing in me. I'll be revealed as the triumphant king. As if surely the Lord could put Judas' name in there. Judas, I want you to know. The world will know. As this great spiritual kingdom is established. As the gospel is preached. And how then we can take these words tonight and we can pray over them. Lord, you have said the world will know. And we can pray even over our own city and over this state. Lord, you've promised. We 
pray to thee that sinners will indeed be brought to know. Uh, this afternoon as I was preparing to come down, uh, the words of a, a song came to my mind that the world will know, let the whole world know. It was written by uh, uh, hymn writer John Peterson. He says, everybody seems to have a cause for which to speak. Loudly from the rooftops they proclaim the things they see. Often are a needless cause and often to deceive. Should not we who know the Lord declare what we believe? Let the whole world know. Let the whole world know. What a message we have to proclaim to this city, to this ungodly world. May we go, as the Lord even said to his disciples, arise, let us go hence. Let us go and bring that message to them. May the Lord take his word and bless it this evening to our hearts. We'll sing in closing, please, the words of the hymn 335. 335. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There... A precious fountain free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. 335, and we'll stand together as we sing these words, please. 335. <laughs>
together. We pray, O oh Lord, that we will continually be drawn to the cross and that therein that we will see that sin has been defeated and that this is indeed a message that the world must hear. O oh Lord, we pray that we will even go forth from this meeting with a renewed vigour for the work of God, a renewed vision to see precious souls brought to thee. And so, Lord, we do pray that the blessing of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit would rest remain and abide upon us till our Saviour comes our cause.